Who would we like on the keyboards? What should we do about the keyboard situation? Well, who, 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 who brought it up? You can't remember. Somebody, somebody it's said... It's just a general thing. What should we do about the keyboard situation? You know. Well, was it any of these people here who said that? Or was it you? Can you remember now? What I remember is this, is that all of us had had a really good time with Paul Bliss and Bias Michelle on Keys of the Kingdom, and they played beautifully. And I think we all wanted to play with them. How many interviews have you given in your life? I don't know. Have you developed a technique to give evasive answers to questions that are difficult that you do not want to answer? Objection. Sustain. Who exactly brought up whether or not Mirage should continue with the group? Ask and answer, ask and answer. Three times. At least twice. Doesn't remember. Right. What did John... I'll ask sustained. it this way. What did you say, pro or con, about Patrick Moraz at that meeting? What did I say, pro or con? Yeah, what did you say about the whole situation? What do you remember saying? I said I'd rather work with Paul and Bias. Is that all you can remember? Yeah, it didn't last very long. What did Ray Thomas say about the subject of Patrick Moraz? I think he said exactly the same as I did. What did John Lodge say? The same. It was an agree. It was quite unanimous. And what did Graham Edge say? It was unanimous. So that you've just said that that's the four. So that it was all we can remember. All you can remember from this meeting is a unanimous decision that we'd rather not work with Patrick. No other facts, right? Absolutely. Why didn't Patrick Moraz contribute much to the album Keys of the Kingdom? I don't think he was that interested. What facts do you have to support that statement? I feel... I don't have any facts to support that. I can just tell you what I feel and what my experience is. Well, tell me what you feel and what your experiences are then. I feel that Patrick lost interest in the Moody Blues in the mid-80s, and I don't believe he was giving us his best performance. And why do you say, why do you believe that he lost interest in the movie boys? I think his mind was on other things. He had a lot of other things going on in his life and different projects. And maybe the Moody Blues didn't quite come up to his expectations of us either. You, are you involved in any other projects? I do other things, yes. Sure. Has anybody ever said to you that, gee, maybe you're not totally interested in the Moody Blues? In the Moody Blues? Yeah. No. What was the record you just put out of these uh, remakes last, last year? It was put out in Great Britain and in Europe, yes. And what's it called? It was called Classic Blue. And what is it? It was uh, a, an album with me singing and a friend of mine, Mike Batt, conducting the London Philharmonic Orchestra. And then before that, you had an album called Moving Mountains? Yes. And that came out in England and a little bit in America? Uh, yeah. And it came out on a label that you went, went bankrupt or something, right? It came out on Tower Bell, yeah, in England. It was a, not a very successful record in terms of sales, right? Not really, no. What, what was the previous record that you did that was a solo record before that? Previous record before that was uh, Night Flight. And when did that come out? Um, 81. And then uh, you worked on a movie called She, right? Uh, yes. And you were on the War of the Worlds album that Jeff Wayne produced? Yes. And you did something with a children's TV show? Yes. What, what did you do? I wrote a theme and some incidental music for um, a, a children's cartoon series called The Shoe People. And you, written by a friend of mine. you've had a separate business as a running a stud farmer or something with horses? No, I love, I've always loved horses since I was a kid, and um, it's one of my ambitions to own a small farm, and uh, so that's what I did, yes. And I converted it from an arable farm to a stud farm, yes. I had it for seven years. But no one ever criticized you in spite of those other interests 
for not devoting the full energies that were necessary to the Moody Blues, right? My energies were always for the Moody Blues. It's always number one with me. You were aware that Patrick uh, was always making himself uh, available for Moody Blues, blues uh, projects and tours whenever required, weren't you? Yes, sometimes we worked around his schedule. He'd tell us what his schedule was and we'd work around that. And he went on, for example, on a tour of England for the uh, abused children of some sort, wasn't it? SPCC, what's it called? SPCC tour? And SPCC? We, the Moody Blues, did a tour of England to benefit the uh, NSPCC, yes. No, National we, Society for the Protection of Cruelty to Children. To children. And, and Moraz got paid next to nothing for that tour, right? We got paid the same as the rest of us, yeah. Which was very limited. Mm -hmm. And when Moraz went out and... And by the way, with respect to that tour, Moraz uh, was the person who was delegated to go give the check to the Duke of Westminster, right? I don't remember that. No. Well, if he had gone, would that be surprising to you? It would have been rather surprising to me, yes. Why? Because I would have considered that either Graham, Ray, John, or myself would have done that. Well, you did a promotional. Uh, I mean, Patrick was, Patrick was treated effectively as an equal member of the Moody Blues for publicity and touring purposes. Wasn't he? No. All right, we'll take a brief pause and come back and continue with Justin Hayward's testimony. Please join us. For highlights of the day's trials, Back. I'm Carol Randolph, and with me in studio is Martin Gold. We've been in day two of the case of Moraz versus the Moody Blues, and so we thought we'd give you a little bit more of an update about what's going on with that, and here with the background on that is Steve Johnson. Keyboardist Patrick Moraz never in his wildest dreams thought he would be what he is today, an ex-member of the Moody Blues. This successful British rock group, affectionately called the Moody's, has been making hit records for nearly 30 years. Nights in white satin. One of their best known songs, Nights in White Satin, went to number two on the record charts in 1972. Many more hits followed over the years. In all, the band has had 21 songs make it to the top 100 list. In 1978, Swiss-born keyboardist Patrick Moraz joined the group. Moraz was a well-respected musician who had previously played with another successful band, the British rock group Yes. Moraz says that within two years after joining the Moody Blues, he reached an oral agreement with the group and became a permanent, lifetime member of the band. But several years later, Moraz says he noticed something was wrong. I discovered that uh, there's been some kind of a, a plot to kind of ease me out. Moraz says in 1991, the band illegally fired him so they could split his share of the royalties. He says he is now destitute and is facing eviction from the California home he rents. It's one of the, the very um, true but very sad stories of rock and roll where rock and roll not, is not that glamorous, especially not for me. The Moody's say Moraz was never a lifetime member of the band. They say he was merely a musician who they hired before each tour or album they wanted him to work on. Moody's attorney Don Ingle says the band's decision not to offer Moraz a contract for the 1991 tour was Moraz's own fault. Mr. Moraz, in 1988, moved from England to the United States and for the ostensible purpose of pursuing other aspects of his career, such as writing film scores. So in a sense, he left the Moody Blues. Now, Moraz is taking his former bandmates to court, suing them for breach of contract and royalties to the tune of some $3.7 million. But the Moody's remain undaunted. We're friends, and um, we know what the truth of, of this case is, and uh, we're, we've been together for long enough as a band, and we've come through a lot worse crisis than, than this. 
All right, we're going to continue with that testimony. This is, again, day two of the case of Mraz versus the Moody Blues, and Justin Hayward is still on the stand. No. Do you remember ever appearing on a radio show with Patrick Mraz in 1984? Um, no. All right, let me read the following and ask if this refreshes your recollection. There was a caller. Mm -hmm. I was wondering why you chose Patrick to replace Mike. Was it because of the difference in his style or the similarities between the two? Justin Hayward. For me, I think Patrick gave a sort of a boot into the 80s. If you like with the technology he's got at his fingertips, as it mm -hmm. were, he kind of chose us, actually. It goes on from there. Remember saying that? Well, that sounds like the kind of thing I would have said then, yeah. What was... What were your needs when Patrick Moraz started working with you in 1978? What did, what did you need out of a keyboard player? We needed somebody to play the parts faithfully to the hits that we already had, that we built up in the previous years. <coughs> and could Moraz do that faithfully? I believe that he could do that faithfully, yeah. And he did do it, didn't he? Uh, he did at the beginning, yeah. When did he? When did it start going awry? Then, if that's what the implication is from your answer, I would say uh, about eighty-two, eighty-three. Then why did you keep him in the band from eighty-two until ninety-one if he wasn't doing as good as he was supposed to have been doing? Well, I think there are a number of reasons. I think partly there was so much. Partly we were afraid of this kind of situation because there was so much um, legal stuff that came with him, you know. It was a constant niggle, all the legal stuff that went backwards and forwards. It's a bit like having a bad leg or something. You'd just rather put up with it sometimes and than go to the doctor, you know, that kind of thing. I think there was also, as just is an English sort of uh, English ostrich element about it, isn't it? You kind of put your head in the sand and think it might get better or go away. You know, he was guilty of some of that too. So you're saying that by '82 or so, he was already so entrenched that you were worried he might sue you if you tried to tell him he was no longer wanted. I think there was an element of that in it. Yes. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Um. I wouldn't say that we were so entrenched. I would say that the sheer volume of material that we received from his legal people was just a little scary. Mm -hmm. Why didn't you just have a conversation with Patrick about it? You couldn't have a conversation with Patrick like that. Well, did you see that? He'd say you'd have to discuss it with his lawyer. Are you saying that uh, it was his idea to have his lawyers talking to your lawyers? Most of the time, yes. Really? His position, I think you know by now well, is that he was not allowed to dock business with you or any other of the defendants here, but that his lawyer had to talk to your lawyer. Are you aware of that? Objection. 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 Why didn't you just do an overall... Uh, global contract with Patrick then in 82 and get it over with once and for all? Because I think Patrick's sense of his own importance would have been a global contract for him would have been very different to what we'd have thought the global contract that his worth to us would have been. That's why. In 82, he was getting an equal share on the tours, right? I don't know. You don't know, huh? I believe so. I believe so. I'm sorry. And, uh... I never paid too much attention to that. You don't pay hardly any attention to business, right? I guess I'm not, I'm not too good at it, no. Do you know what Bias Bochelle makes right now? No. Uh, do you know what Patrick Moraz, how he was compensated with respect to Long Distance Voyager? No. Do you know whether or not he got a percentage on that album? Uh, no, I don't. Do you know whether Patrick Moraz has received a percentage uh, royalty on any record that he's ever made with the Moody Blues? Yes, he's received the royalty, yes. And what records would that be with respect to? Well, 
I would assume that they were... Long Distance Voyager would be the only one that I don't know. I don't know what his arrangements would be on that record. And on the other records, what did he get percentage-wise, do you know? No, I don't know the exact percentage, but I, I believe that it was uh, 17, 17 and a half. And but isn't it... Keys of the Kingdom. Where he got no percentage. <coughs> yeah. And, in fact, wasn't he always pushing saying, I want my 20% that you've always promised me. I'm tired of my 17 or 17.5%, whatever it is. Well, he's always pushing. Right. Well, for something, yeah. Does that bother you that he was pushing, that he was fighting for his rights? That makes you, that made you upset? No, it didn't make me upset. It just gave me an impression of, of him, you know, that, and I think it rather soured the relationship. Because he was asking for money. Well, he was always asking for money. And that, that's just distasteful, right? Not <laughs> particularly. It just doesn't make for a great musical relationship. All right, we're into the second Moody Blue testimony, if you will, and I, I haven't heard that smoking gun. I don't know. Uh, what do you think, Marty? I agree with you, Carol. Um, what I'm listening for, what, I, what I'm looking to hear, is what's the plaintiff's case? What's mm. the plaintiff's side of the story? Mm -hmm. What he's doing instead is calling the opposing witnesses and trying to, to impeach them. That doesn't seem to me to establish his case. He's got a burden of establishing what happened. Yeah, the only thing we were talking also is the fact that he states that um, if, if the defense is saying that Miraz is too busy and involved in various things, I think he countered that pretty much, at least with Justin showing that he obviously was a very busy person. But as you say, I don't know where we're going with that. I agree with you. He did accomplish that point. Uh, but still we're waiting to, to hear uh, what his story is. And we haven't heard any uh, shocking, anything shocking here that justifies calling the defendants. I think the only shocking thing about seeing them is, uh, coming, is my coming to the recognition that rock and roll stars are about my age these days. <laughs> <laughs> we, we talked about that, <laughs> comparing those two. You know, also Johnson, uh, uh, Neville Johnson, in his opening remarks uh, stated that uh, Morass made more money before he became, if you will, a, uh, a contracted uh, 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 Moody Blue player. So why, I mean, I was confused about that. Why bring that up and then show that he's, he's contracted for less? What are we missing? What did I miss on that? Well, Carol, whatever you're missing is also going right past me. I'm, uh, I'm repeating myself, but I'm waiting to hear what's his version of the story. Where is the oral contract? He should put his client on the stand, get it over with, and tell us what happened. All right. Well, maybe we'll get that in our next testimony. When we come back, we'll hear the phone conversation with uh, uh, Mraz, uh, that uh, Mr. Mraz had with Justin Haywood, and perhaps we'll get more information about that. This is around the time of his firing. Stay with us. <laughs> All right, we're going to go back to that testimony. Justin Hayward is on the stand, and he's going to be asked about the phone conversation he had with their manager, Tom Hewlett, just around the time of the firing of uh, Patrick Moraz. So maybe that's our smoking gun. Amazing. Do you know when Moraz was told by Hewlett that he would no longer be needed? I don't know the date now. Why didn't... You, uh, you or anybody in the group call Patrick to say goodbye? I did. He called you first, didn't he? No. When did you call him? I called him um, within, I suppose, a week after but, that decision being made. But the decision was initially made to have Hewlett call him, right? Yeah. And why was that? Why Eulid as opposed to you or anybody else? Well, I don't think any of us fancied it. When you did talk to Patrick, well, describe for me as best you can exactly word for word the conversation that occurred. <laughs> well, I, I called Patrick and left a message on his answer machine that I'd like to speak to him. And then he called me back. And... Um, he asked me if it was a unanimous decision, and I said yes. And then he 
and then I said that the, the purpose that I wanted to speak to him was to tell him that I would never talk out of turn or um, say anything bad about him in the press and that I think that that would be uh, that was that was what we the four of us felt that we wouldn't do that is that it for the discussion yeah did uh, did you tell him that you were totally surprised that it was brought up and that it happened no did you tell him that the reason he was terminated was that money's at the top of the list? No. Well, then let's go back again to the reasons he was terminated. It was, as he I said, said, was as money something to do with it? And I said, partly. Partly. All right. What else? What? What, in your opinion, are the reasons why Moraz was terminated? He wasn't playing the parts anymore. Didn't sound good. Is that it? I th I feel he lost interest. It didn't sound good. He was playing out of tune, and I don't think he was interested anymore. It wasn't a good it wasn't a good relationship anymore. Now, I can promise you that if it had have been good for the Moody Blues, it, Patrick Mraz would still have been playing for the Moody Blues. You mean if he had stopped asking for a raise? No, if the whole thing had been good for the Moody Blues. Um, can you tell me, when you say he uh, didn't sound good and was out of tune and wasn't playing the parts anymore, mm -hmm. can, are, you, are we talking about sound recordings or live? <coughs> well, on, on live recordings. On, I mean, on live, on live performances, yeah. Right. Can you tell me any performances any performances where Mraz hit any of that criteria you just mentioned? Well, every one of them hit that criteria for me. All right. I, I will represent to you, and tomorrow I will come here with a half a dozen Moody Blues tapes. In fact, I understand, tell me if I'm right or wrong, that virtually every single Moody Blues concert the last 15 years has been recorded by the fans. Do you agree with that? I don't know. Well, I mean, bootlegged. Boot, well, they're talked about in Higher and Higher. You know what Higher and Higher is, right? Yeah. In fact, you, uh, you approve every issue of Fire and Higher before it goes out, don't you? Uh, they send me a copy, yeah. I don't approve it, but they well, send but me you, a copy. Well, but you read the copy before it goes out. Uh, I used to at the beginning. I don't anymore. Um, And you're aware that the fans who make videos of your shows and yeah. tapes, of most, lots of them, right? That's why this whole thing is so subjective. It's my opinion. All right, so you're saying subjectively you did not like Mraz's playing on, was it every song, every concert, every minute? He had a keyboard that you used to put around your neck and play it like a guitar, and it had like a pitch wheel thing on it that you would, to keep the pitch, you would have to move this wheel, and it was out of tune, you know, it just didn't sound good. And how I'm many, sorry, but it just didn't sound, I can't, you know. You're entitled to your opinion. And how much of the time would he play, what's it called, a clavicure, something like that? A clavichord, I think. Clavichord, called, yeah. How, how much in every concert would he play that, five minutes, ten minutes, one song? Um, no, I, I don't know. I don't know how many songs play. Now, do you play all, three or four songs with it? Do you always play perfectly your guitar? I shouldn't think so. No. And you sometimes break a string, right? Uh, very rarely, as a matter of fact. But it happens. No, I don't know. Twice in ten years, I've got a, a beautifully balanced guitar. Well, now is your opportunity to tell us the kind of strings you use that are so solid. They sell my high tones. All right, thank you. I don't you. make them anymore. But you have a stock that's available. I do, yes. Uh, and you don't always, always sing every single note perfectly on pitch. No. 
In fact, it was reported that you had throat problems on the European tour, didn't you? Um, I can't remember it being reported, but I, I did have a cold. And, yeah. and John Lodge, is he always absolutely spot on perfect singing and playing bass? He sounds good to me. And how about Graham Edge? I, I wouldn't want to go on stage with anybody else but those three guys. I know but that. they sometimes make mistakes. We all make mistakes, yeah. <clears throat> now, why do you say that Patrick Moraz uh, lost interest? He just, he just lost interest. He seemed to me to lose interest. He seemed to become a little bit bored with the whole Rudy Blues things, particularly on recordings. Isn't it in fact true he was doing everything he could to get on a Moody Blues records as both a not only as a performer but to try and get his songs at all times? I wasn't aware of that. Do you remember the time he sat and played 13 songs for you in the studio? Well, you mentioned that before and, and I don't remember that. No, that shows you what kind of impression they made on me because I don't, I'm here under oath and I tell you I don't remember that now. Do you remember a time when he came to your house and played you a song and you said, I really like it, but I have to take 95% of it and put my name on it. Are you willing to do that? Do you remember doing that? That's outrageous. That's ridiculous. He's lying. Yes. If, if he would say that to you, it's a lie. He'll say it to you. All right, we're going to take a brief pause and come back and continue with our testimony from Justin Hayward. Line. All right, it's day two. Once again, Moraz versus the Moody Blues, and things are getting a little heated in that courtroom. Let's go back and join Justin Hayward. He's on the stand being examined by McNeville Johnson. How much was money a factor in the, in the decision to discontinue your relationship with Moraz? I don't think it was. Well, you said in your conversation with Moraz that it was one of the factors. It was partly, yeah, but it wasn't the, that wasn't what the decision was about. How much money have you saved by discontinuing to work with Moraz? I don't know. tour, Keys of the Kingdom. There is no picture of Bias Bushell, right? Mm-hmm. Why not? I well, shouldn't think he wants one. You don't think he wants to be on? <laughs> Bias isn't that kind of person, you know, he's not, he's not really interested in that kind of side of it. In other words, you were looking for a person who would be more of an employee type. We weren't looking for anybody. Bias had already been playing with us since 1985, and we'd known him since, you know, the early 80s. Bias went on, I think, the 86 tour backing up Moraz, right? Yes. And he was with that keyboard, and you have a backup keyboard player. He's way off to the side, right? Um, no, he's not way off to the side. He's, he's on that side of the stage, yeah. All right, and then... He's equal. You added the uh, singing dancing ladies at some point to the show, right? The backup singers, yes. Right. When was that? 86. And then the second drummer was added when? Um, 91. And none of them are on the album cover or on the, the tour one sheet, right? No, they're in the program. Pictures and in the they're, program. They're in the program as backup people, right? Yeah. Yet when Patrick was in the programs, he was mm -hmm. always one of the five Moody Blues, right? He was represented on the pictures with us, yeah. And there was, and each person would get his own picture and then his own page of biographical material, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. But you don't do that for, I mean, there were, and then there were four is mm -hmm. what has happened now, right? 
Well, the question is, when was, yeah. the, when was the decision made to have four Moody Blues? There's been four Moody Blues since Mark Pindola. <laughs> Except for programs that are given out to the audience and album covers, there's five, right? Except for programs and album covers, you see a picture where there's <coughs> five, yes. Uh, was the person who was delegated to go give the check to the Duke of Westminster, right? I don't remember that, no. Well, if he had gone, would that be surprising to you? It would have been rather surprising to me, yes. Why? Because I would have considered that either Graham, Ray, John, or myself would have done that. Well, you did a promotional. Uh, I mean, Patrick was, Patrick was treated effectively as an equal member of the movie Blues for publicity and touring purposes, wasn't he? No. All right, we'll take a brief pause and come back and continue with Justin Hayward's testimony. Please join us. For highlights of the day's trials, I'm Carol Randolph, and with me in studio is Martin Gold. We've been in day two of the case of Mraz versus the Moody Blues, and so we thought we'd give you a little bit more of an update about what's going on with that, and here with the background on that is Steve Johnson. Keyboardist Patrick Mraz, never in his wildest dreams, thought he would be what he is today, an ex-member of the Moody Blues. This successful British rock group, affectionately called the Moody's, has been making hit records for nearly 30 years. Nights in white satin. One of their best known songs, Nights in White Satin, went to number two on the record charts in 1972. Many more hits followed over the years. In all, the band has had 21 songs make it to the top 100 list. In 1978, Swiss-born keyboardist Patrick Mraz joined the group. Mraz was a well-respected musician. I don't think he was that interested. What facts do you have to support that statement? I feel... I don't have any facts to support that. I can just tell you what I feel and what my experience is. Well, tell me what you feel and what your experiences are then. I feel that Patrick lost interest in the Moody Blues in the mid-80s. And I don't believe he was giving us his best performance. And why do you say, why do you believe that he lost interest in the movie Blues? I think his mind was on other things. He had a lot of other things going on in his life and different projects. And maybe the Moody Blues didn't quite come up to his expectations of us either. You, are you involved in any other projects? I do other things, yes. Sure. Has anybody ever said to you that, gee, maybe you're not totally interested in the Moody Blues? In the Moody Blues? Yeah. No. What was the record you just put out of these uh, remakes last, last year? It was put out in Great Britain and in Europe, yes. And what's it called? It was called Classic Blue. And what is it? It was uh, a, an album with me singing and a friend of mine, Mike Batt, conducting the London Philharmonic Orchestra. And then before that you had an album called Moving Mountains? Yes. And that came out in England and a little bit in America? Uh, yeah. And it came out on a label that you went, went bankrupt or something, right? It came out on Tower Bell, yeah, in England. It was a, not a very successful record in terms of sales, right? Not really, no. What, what was the previous record that you did that was a solo record before that? Previous record before that was uh, Night Flight. And when did that come out? Um, 81. And then, uh... Who would we like on the keyboards? What should we do about the keyboard situation? Well, who, 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 who brought it up? You can't remember. Somebody, somebody it's said... It's just a general thing. What should we do about the keyboard situation? You know. Well, was it any of these people here who said that? Or was it you? Can you remember now? What I remember is this. 
is that all of us had had a really good time with Paul Bliss and Bias Michelle on Keys of the Kingdom, and they played beautifully. And I think we all wanted to play with them. How many interviews have you given in your life? I don't know. Have you developed a technique to give evasive answers to questions that are difficult that you do not want to answer? Sustain. Who exactly brought up whether or not Mirage should continue with the group? Aspen answered, Aspen answered. Three times. At least twice. Doesn't remember. All right. What Jack, did Jack, John... Jack, I'll Jack ask it this way. What did you say, pro or con, about Patrick Mraz at that meeting? What did I say, pro or con? Yeah. What did you say about the whole situation? What do you remember saying? I said I'd rather work with Paul and Bias. Is that all you can remember? Yeah, it didn't last very long. What did Ray Thomas say about the subject of Patrick Mraz? I think he said exactly the same as I did. What did John Lodge say? The same. It was in a agree. It was quite unanimous. And what did Graham Edge say? It was unanimous, so that you've just said that that's the four of So us. it was all we can remember, all you can remember from this meeting is a unanimous decision that we'd rather not work with Patrick. No other facts, right? Absolutely. Why didn't Patrick Moraz contribute much to the album Keys of the Kingdom? You worked on a movie called She, right? Uh, yes. And you were on the War of the Worlds album that Jeff Wayne produced? Yes. And you did something with a children's TV show? Yes. What, what did you do? I wrote a theme and some incidental music for um, a, a children's cartoon series called The Shoe People. And you, written by a friend of mine. you've had a separate business as a running a stud farmer or something for horses? No, I love, I've always loved horses since I was a kid, and um, it's one of my ambitions to own a small farm, and uh, so that's what I did, yes. And I converted it from an arable farm to a stud farm, yes. I had it for uh, seven years. But no one ever criticized you in spite of those other interests for not devoting the full energies that were necessary to the Moody Blues, right? My energies were always for the Moody Blues. It's always number one with me. You were aware that Patrick uh, was always making himself uh, available for Moody Blues, blues uh, projects and tours whenever required, weren't you? Yes, sometimes we worked around his schedule. He'd tell us what his schedule was and we'd work around that. And he went on, for example, on a tour of England for the uh, abused children of some sort, wasn't it? SPCC, is it called? SPCC tour? And SPCC? We, the Moody Blues, did a tour of England to benefit the uh, NSPCC, yes. No, National we, Society for the Protection of Cruelty to Children. To children. And, and Mraz got paid next to nothing for that tour, right? We got paid the same as the rest of us, yeah. Which was very limited. Mm -hmm. And when Mraz went out and... Uh, and by the way, with respect to that tour, Mraz... Uh, ...who had previously played with another successful band, the British rock group Yes. Mraz says that within two years after joining the Moody Blues, he reached an oral agreement with the group and became a permanent, lifetime member of the band. But several years later, Moraz says he noticed something was wrong. I discovered that uh, there's been some kind of a, a plot to kind of ease me out. Moraz says in 1991, the band illegally fired him so they could split his share of the royalties. He says he is now destitute and is facing eviction from the California home he rents. It's one of the, the very... Um, true but very sad stories of rock and roll where rock and roll not, is not that glamorous especially not for me the moody's say Mraz was never a lifetime member of the band they say he was merely a musician who they hired before each tour or album they wanted him to work on moody's attorney don ingle says the band's decision not to offer Mraz a contract for the 1991 tour was Mraz's own fault mr Mraz in 1988 moved from England to the United States. 
and for the ostensible purpose of pursuing other aspects of his career, such as writing film scores. So in a sense, he left the Moody Blues. Now, Moraz is taking his former bandmates to court, suing them for breach of contract and royalties to the tune of some $3.7 million. But the Moody's remain undaunted. We're friends, and um, we know what the truth of, of this case is, and uh, we're, we've been together for long enough as a band, and we've come through a lot worse crisis than, than this. All right, we're going to continue with that testimony. This is, again, day two of the case of Mraz versus the Moody Blues, and Justin Hayward is still on the stand. No. Do you remember ever appearing on a radio show with Patrick Mraz in 1984? Um, no. All right, let me read the following and ask if this refreshes.